Hello and welcome to this episode of How to Be a Great GM. In this episode, we're looking at that all-important question of when can you fudge it and when should you stick to the rules. Now, in the comments on almost all of the videos on this channel, there have been some strong debates as to whether the game master, the narrator, the storyteller, the director, the poor sod who's in charge of the game, should fake roles, make up numbers, or should stick rigidly to the set of rules as prescribed in the role-playing game that you are playing. And I have released many videos where I advocate that you ignore the numbers, you ignore the rules, and you make everything up. And rightly so, this has been rewarded by some with criticism that it takes away the game element of role-playing games. And I totally agree. It really does. So do I, in my role-playing games, ignore every role? No. And this video is about exploring the fine balance between when to use the dice value, when to use a rule, and when to ignore it and overrule it. The reason why I haven't done this particular video in the past is because for me, this is really one of the pinnacle moments in a GM's career is where you can strike a balance between using the rules and being used by the rules. So if you take anything away from this particular video, it's that there should always be some kind of balance that you as the game master strive to achieve that is unnoticeable by the players. Now this is something that's very difficult to do because you as the game master have to try and read your players and try and understand what it is that they are looking for from the game. And there's no amount of videos that can help you do that. You simply have to watch their reactions to the effects that your story is having on them. If they seem to be enjoying themselves, then whatever it is that you're doing is making sense and is working. If they are disinterested, if they're bored, if they're looking on their cell phones, then whatever it is that you're doing has not grabbed them and you need to change your tactic. Now sometimes this is because the narrative is dull. Sometimes though it's because the dice or the rules are simply too prescriptive to allow anything to happen. So I'm going to use some examples to illustrate my points here because really this is a video on my thoughts on the subject and I stand open to comments in order to improve upon this idea. So if we take a basic system that everyone seems to be familiar with or has come across in the past, the D20 system, whether that is D20 Modern, whether that is Pathfinder, whether that is Star Wars, whether that is good old fashioned Dungeons and Dragons, the D20 system prescribes that you use a D20 plus a whole bunch of other dice to determine the outcome of very many things. Now a classic example of where I ignore the dice rolls. An encounter, or at least a random encounter. One of the suggestions in the book is that in an environment there is a percentage chance, a 1 in 10 or 2 in 10 or 3 in 10 chance, of encountering a creature. The GM decides that this particular moment in the story is when the players are preambulating from one point to another, and they decide that it's going to take eight hours for the characters to get from point A to point B. Now the rules prescribe that for every hour of travel you roll a d10. They roll the first hour, nothing happens. They roll the second hour, still nothing happens. They roll the third hour. Aha, we finally have an encounter. Right, now I page through my rule book to go and find what that encounter is. I roll it using more dice and I get a number. The number prescribes that they have an encounter with a bunch of orcs. Or whatever table has suitably been drawn up for you for your particular world if you don't have orcs or whatever the situation demands. You then throw the random number of orcs against the players and they have a combat. They still have four more journeys to get through on your D10. Aha! Another encounter. And yet another encounter. And yet another encounter. 
So here the dice are prescribing that the poor players should now slog through an encounter after an encounter and after an encounter. For every one player at the table, a standard encounter of standard difficulty should take about three or four minutes per player in the combat. Four players means that you're spending 15 to 20 minutes on a single combat encounter. You've now just spent almost two hours covering from point A to point B because the dice have prescribed that you should be rolling encounter options. Now, this might be fun for some people, but for others, it can become particularly tedious. What if you're traveling over days? Are you going to roll 120 dice? I don't think so. But on the other hand, people might say, oh, but that's a rule that you can ignore. What about combat rules? What about when we're in the middle of combat? Now, one of the things that I advocate is that the statistics of the monsters should rely primarily on the level of your characters rather than what is written in the book. Now, the reason why I advocate this is so that I can have orcs facing against my characters at level 1 and orcs facing against my characters at level 15 and that they are still going to pose the same kind of threat to the party. They are still going to be dangerous. So, in the encounter where the players are facing off against an orc, let's say the orc has plus 10. Uh, the characters are now level 10. So the orc makes his roll. I roll it in front of my players. I don't need to hide it because I now go, right, 28, that hits your character. Their damage is a d8 because they're using a sword, and the sword has plus 7 to damage, so that's 9 damage. I watch as my players' characters start to lose life. Now, this is the critical part that I personally maintain. Once one orc has collapsed, if the party is still going strong and still has no fear of these orcs whatsoever, and I wanted this encounter to be particularly dangerous to maybe steer them away from this area or to steer them in another direction, well, then suddenly my orcs, if the party is healthy, will continue to fight on. On the other hand, if I see that party members are dropping left, right and center, and it looks as if my orcs are going to simply overpower them because the party has made a mistake or a misjudgment in terms of the spells that they should use, or one of the players is just trying out a different type of combat technique, instead of then relying on the dice to then destroy the characters because the book says the orcs don't take prisoners, or whatever creature it might be, or because the narrative has declared that orcs don't take prisoners. In this particular instance, I'm not going to ignore the dice rolls. I'm going to continue to use them until all the players have been knocked unconscious. Players that go into the negative areas, unless they are decapitated by a particularly powerful roll or quite high damage, will then be captured by the orcs. So again, ignoring a little bit of law there. So the idea behind fudging rolls is not so that you simply make everything up as you go along and that you don't have any consistency anywhere. The idea is that you are going to make up numbers, if necessary, to get the orcs, one of the orcs, for example, maybe as they're about to kill the last player goes, hmm, the GM rolled a five. The players saw that the GM rolled a five. What does that five mean? Well, if in your head you were rolling it that it was an intelligence check for the orc to realize that taking these players' characters prisoner could result in a nice fat bounty, the dice have just said the orc didn't think to do that. The dice have just said, kill the last player character. Now, some people say, well, then that's right, the player should die. Well, the player character anyway should die. The player should stay alive for a little bit longer unless they screw up again, in which case feel free to execute them. But the point is, is that a lot of people will just rely on the dice to determine the outcome of everything. That's okay in one instance. On the other hand, a player who has to make up character after character after character because of bad roles on their behalf and because of good roles on behalf of the GM or because their character that they created is not as powerfully built and as perfectly built as the rules might presume. Remember the monsters and rule books, whether it's Dungeons and Dragons or Star Wars or Star Trek or whatever system you're using, those have been designed for a specific party size in mind and they've been designed optimally. Player characters sometimes are designed optimally, sometimes they are designed too optimally. 
in which case the balance is thrown out yet again because now the players are simply too strong for any kind of creature they come across because the creatures are expecting an average party capacity. Nonetheless, if a player has created more of a role-playing type of character who's not very good at combat and the dice are being particularly savage against them, that character dies. What's the feeling that's left inside of your player? Is it a feeling of, gosh dag nabbit, well I need to make a better character and make my numbers better? Yes, that's possibly one feeling. Is the other feeling, oh, well, I'll just make another character and I don't care about his backstory because he's probably not going to live beyond the second encounter anyway because he's going to, you know, die because he doesn't have any hit points or he doesn't have the right armor or he doesn't have the plus 12 magical weapon or etc, etc. For me, the point is not about creating in the players a desire to overcome the numbers because if that's what you're doing, then effectively you are creating players who are more concerned with numbers and less concerned with narrative and with role playing than you are if you were to create a space where people can create a blind monk who has disadvantage on his roles, who has nine, minus 20% to physical attacks, but who has high wisdom. You are disenfranchising yourself as well as the player by denying them the capacity to explore the minimums and the averages of scores and of values and of rolling if you are going to stick to the prescribed values. So I don't for a second advocate that every encounter has wildly different numbers and that an orc today is not nearly as powerful or is more powerful than an orc tomorrow. I'm advocating finding that balance between the mathematics and the narrative. I always hold that the narrative is far more important than the mathematics, but remember, and you can go and watch this video, these dice can be really used to help create tension in your game. Because if you're rolling numbers and you're using those numbers and you're adding to them or you're subtracting from them depending on how you feel, the players are going to be trying to anticipate what's going to happen. Now, some people have raised the point, ah, but you are going to make players no longer want to play the game because if you as the GM are going to decide when they die and when they live by changing the numbers, then the players will have no sense of mortality and every encounter will be dismissed as merely a few roles and the GM is going to keep us alive because he wants to tell his story. That's an absolutely true statement. If you are constantly keeping your players alive because you're whitewashing the battles when they start to lose, then you're not telling a very good story. The whole point of narrative, apart from the main center line of the story, is to make it tense, to make it interesting, to make it exciting. So although your players are going to survive the encounter in all likelihood, you should be using these numbers to really make it feel as if they're not. Now, where does this wisdom come from? It comes from Gary Gygax, who was one of the original authors of Dungeons and Dragons way back when in the 70s. He said players should have, on average, a 70% chance of survival in any encounter, but it should feel like they only have a 30% chance of survival. It should feel like they should only have a 30% chance of survival. Now, argue as you may, the GM is responsible for creating the tension. And some people say the GM is not responsible for story, the GM is not responsible for the dice rolls, the GM is simply there to interpret the outcome of dice rolls. That's fine, and if that's the style you want to go with, that's up to you. If your players respond to it, then you're doing a great job and you're a great game master. On the other hand, I personally see the Game Master as being responsible for interpreting the dice values to make the story interesting. If you're just using the dice to generate values and statistics, do you really even need a GM then? Surely he can just be another player and you take turns determining what encounter happens next, what is the random trap that's in the dungeon floor, since if numbers are going to be prescriptive, you don't need someone to interpret because the rule books are all there and they're all very, very complete. The point 
that I think a lot of people are missing, or at least that I am not making clear enough in a lot of my videos, is that this balance, this line between using the numbers, using the stats, using the written rules, and telling the story is the line that you as a great game master have to tread. Sometimes you have to kill player characters. Not you personally as the narrator, but if you have given the character the opportunity of, oh, make a dexterity check to avoid falling off the rope that's above the chasm. Oh, you failed that. All right, your foot slips off the rope and in a moment of terror, you reach out with your hand. Make an attack roll against the rope to see if you can catch it. Oh, you failed that roll as well. Mickle Mouse, you're standing right next to him. You see him plunging off the rope. His hand is reaching out. Give me a lunge check to see if you can catch him before he disappears into the abyss. You missed that as well. Your fingertips touch and unfortunately poor Broderick tumbles away into the distance. Now here again, in some rule books, for every 10 foot fallen, your character is supposed to take 1d6 up to a maximum of 20d6. So you roll 20d6 and you start doing the maths and you discover that your level 20 hero has fallen 400 meters down into a crevasse and has only taken 100 damage. Well, he's got this magical item, he's got this piece of armor, he's got this and he's got 120 hit points anyway. So he bounces off of the floor and he's absolutely fine. You could prescriptively say that he's landed on some mossy bank and has survived. On the other hand, if the character plunged to his death because he was being silly, I don't feel that that 20d6 should be rolled. It should simply be that he disappears into the mists below and is never heard from again. So there is an example of where I go against the narrative to be more vindictive. Vindictive is the wrong word. It sounds as if I want him to die. There's some times where the narrative just makes more sense than the numbers because I don't think the numbers necessarily work all the time. So again, it's that fine line between you as the GM deciding what works and what doesn't work. What's feasible, what's plausible, and what's the most dramatic. There is no hard and fast rule, and I don't think that anyone will ever come up with some kind of guideline as to this is the time to fudge your roles, this is the time to use your roles, this is the time to apply rules and this is the time not to apply rules. Changing rules must then remain the same throughout. So if your climb check is determined by strength plus this and that, that's what it must be throughout the entire game. Don't feel though that you have to just stick to that. You can modify it over time or if you can describe it in a different way where the player is using their dexterity to leverage themselves between two rocks rather than their strength, now you can change it to dexterity or strength for the other players. But you have to remain consistent. Once you have created a rule or changed a rule, you have to be consistent. So I'm not sure if this video is going to help or if it's going to leave it as confused as before. As a GM, you need to take steps in becoming a great GM. And those steps start with how do you even do it to begin with how do you tell a good story how do you start setting encounter difficulties how do you use the dice to create tension how do you create tone there's so many layers to being a gm and this for me where you're deciding between making a good rules decision versus a narrative decision making dice work for you rather than you being a slave to the dice interpreting what that means to you as a game master and how that's going to affect your game that's the final step really that will determine whether you are a GM who tells a good story but can't hold tension you're a GM who uses the dice and knows all the rules but you can't tell a good story all of those things need to come together under the umbrella of you as an individual interpreting the game and presenting it to your players in a consistent logical to your space way and making sure that the players are enjoying themselves because if they're enjoying themselves and they keep coming back for more then you know 
you are a good, a good game master. If your players are reluctant, if they don't pitch up, then it means that either the players are unfortunately busy or you're just not that captivating. And it's about looking at your different areas. And as I've been getting feedback from you guys, I've been going, am I too story focused? Am I too worried about the, the numbers being fudged and being used differently? Am I too distanced from the actual rules that I ignore rules and that I don't read rule books and that kind of thing? My answer quite simply is I have players who hate playing with me because of that exact reason. On the other hand, I have a waiting list of players ready to come and join my table because of the stories that I tell. Ultimately, we are always going to have people who love our games, people who hate our games, and people who are indifferent to our games. And part of being a GM, I think, is understanding your strengths, understanding where you get the most enjoyment, and then focusing on that, and honing your skills in those areas that work for you, rather than trying to force yourself to become more of a rules lawyer or less of a rules lawyer, more of a storyteller or less of a fudging kind of GM. I don't know if that's constructive or not. I certainly hope it is in some small way. Nonetheless, if you like what I've been saying, hit that like button. If you want to hear more, hit that subscribe button. And if you want to join us on Patreon and join me in a role-playing session via Skype, there's that option too. Head on over to www.greatgamemaster.com. Leave your thoughts and desires and requests for videos so that I might address them in future episodes and see if we can't bring about some greater understanding in this remarkably complicated and yet infinitely simple little game that we call role-playing. Until next time, happy gaming.